is Professor Karin Fersbohr. Sorry, my German accent is probably messing it up. Um, who is the Dean of the School of Computing Technologies at RMIT in Melbourne, um, Australia. And Karen is using artificial intelligence methods to enable biological discovery and clinical decision. And she's also the Victorian node lead and co-founder of the Australian Alliance for Artificial Intelligence in Health. Should we do you first and then? Yeah, so yeah. We'll or should I introduce Emily Maybe right now then? And then, and then we'll just tag team. Okay, yeah. excellent. So the second speaker is Dr. Emily Carl, who is currently a research software engineer specialist in high performance computing at the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at UQ. Um, and she is focusing on developing computational chemistry software for massively parallel architectures and cheap GPU accelerators. Looking forward to your presentations. Thank you. So um, yes, I work on natural language processing, which everybody has heard about by now. Um, that wasn't true six months ago. And I work on that in the context of scientific literature mining and biomedical data, so also clinical natural language processing. And I'm not going to talk to you about any of that today, except maybe slightly obliquely. Um, what I am going to talk to you about is what I have up there, um, which is um, diversity and inclusion and the role that it plays in AI and specifically in the context of data science um, in, in um, science or biomedical data is my area. I'd also just like to acknowledge the country that we're on, which is not the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups, but the, but the indigenous peoples here. Um, so the proposition I would like to put forward to you is that we must put diversity and inclusion into focus when designing, developing, and deploying AI applications. And really the rest of what my words will amount to is to motivate that proposition. So I work on biomedical data. Most of you may not work directly on biomedical data, but you work on data that represents people at some level. So certainly those of you who are working on genomics or bioinformatics, you're very clearly working on, on data that represents people. Um, but even those of you who are working on what you think, you know, maybe astronomy applications, looking at data from the sky, or looking at climate change modeling, I would suggest that all of these things represent people in one way or another. Certainly climate change impacts people very directly. So as we're collecting data, I think it's really important for us to ask the question of who does that data represent, who does that data impact, and who, what are the decisions that we want to be making with data, and who benefits or impact, is impacted by, by those decisions. And so, I like to think about the world as a very diverse and complex place, which has purple people and blue people and gray people of all various sizes and shapes and cultures and language backgrounds and so on. And I think we really need to bear that in mind. Um, why? Partly because when we build these systems, we're building them by people. So it's not just about the data and who the data represents, but also who are the people building the systems. And if we look at that right now in AI, it's a pretty bleak picture. 80% um, of AI professors are men, and the vast majority of those are white. So I'm happy to be in the 20% that are not men, but I am in the majority white class, and I recognize my privilege that comes along with that. Women represent 5% of the AI research staff at Facebook and 10% at Google, and only 2.5% of Google employees and 4% of Microsoft and Facebook employees are black. We have no data on trans workers in these contexts or other gender minorities. We don't know either about neurodivergence, disability, age, or educational attainment. We don't know about culture and linguistic diversity. We don't know about religious diversity. We don't know about many dimensions of diversity. And this matters because the experiences of these people 
are reflected in the tools and technologies that they build. So the cognitive biases that we bring into developing AI solutions and thinking about the data and the problems that we're trying to solve will impact our design decisions. I'm gonna ask you to think about a few contexts where maybe it becomes apparent that this can be a problem. How many of you have been to India? Okay, would you want to drive a self-driving, or be a passenger, sorry, in a self-driving car that was developed in the United States in India? No, right? It's pretty obvious. Why? Because the self-driving car that's developed in the United States makes a ton of assumptions about road conditions, um, you know, lack of potholes in the road, um, nice lane markings that exist to support the self-driving car, and so forth and so on. So those are assumptions are embedded in the solution and in the development of this self-driving car. Would you want a medical decision-making tool that was built with GP data applied to in a hospital? Probably not. It's very different kind of data and a very different set of decisions that need to be made. So these are just general kind of aspects of assumptions that are built in to our models. Could an effective assistive technology for the visually be impaired be designed, oh, be designed, I've duplicated myself there, um, without understanding the experiences and needs of blind people? Would you want to make an assistive technology without talking to a blind person? I mean, we can all close our eyes, assuming you're not blind, and try to imagine what it might like to be blind, but I would suggest that's not the same. Do you want to be screened for a job based on a tool that reads your face for emotional cues? Think about what could go wrong there. What kinds of cultural biases might be embedded in a tool like that? Now, there is, in fact, a tool on the market that does that. So these models not only are built by people that are not reflective of the broad diversity of our population, but they also reflect the data that they're trained on. And so we have to ask questions like, where does the data come from? Who compiled the data? Who labeled the data? We talk a lot these days in the context of generative AI and large language models about you know, models that have been inferred in an unsupervised way from data. But the little secret is that OpenAI doesn't advertise too broadly, is that actually they use a lot of supervision from humans. So who's doing all of that supervision? Who's providing what are considered to be the good answers for the prompts that are in the prompt libraries used in training? What kind of genders do they reflect? Languages, geographical regions, the domains of knowledge. Um, you know, we heard Rick talking earlier about using, using tools for science. Well, what kind of scientific knowledge is captured in these models? What are the cultural contexts? What are the time frames? We can keep asking questions. Data are biased. You type CEO into Google image search, and this is what you get back. I hope it's changed recently, but anyway, a screenshot from, from a little while ago. What do we see? Mostly men, mostly white men, mostly middle-aged white men. The occasional woman, one woman. Is two women in there? One. So that's what we think of when we search for CEO. Is that what we want to see? <laughs> it's not what I want to see. Models perpetuate and entrench existing biases. That's not to say the world isn't biased in that way. It is. We've got to work on that, too. Okay. So bias in to a data-driven model means we're going to get bias out. And we have to really think about the impacts of that. And there's lots of ways this can go wrong. And we already knew about this back in 2016 when Microsoft released Tay, and, uh, which was kind of an early chatbot. And it was shut down with a matter of hours because Tay started responding with very, very, well, with hate speech, basically and had to be shut, shut down. Um, we have lots of examples of toxic outputs that are produced with ChatGPT. And they're putting guardrails in place, but the data is in there. There's a reason that these models produce harmful text. 
the errors in these systems are also not randomly distributed. So we know that facial recognition technology simply doesn't see darker skinned people. Again, because the data it's been trained on is biased. And the, the, the differences actually mean that those tools are not reliable in the context of the underrepresented groups in that data. These biases can worsen over time. So there are examples of tools being used to help police surveil particular neighborhoods. Well, guess what? If they get an alert in a particular neighborhood, they start paying more attention to that neighborhood. And then they find more cr crime in those neighborhoods. And so then they pay more attention to those neighborhoods and they find more crime and so on and so forth. This is not good. The other thing to remember is that our statistical models are inferring probabilities from all this data and they're basically averaging things out. And so these models are um, very challenged by imbalanced data and we have to think about the bias, uh, uh, bias variance trade-off that exists in there. Our evaluations are based on aggregate rather than stratified performance. And I don't know how many of you have played with ChatGPT, but you might find that it generates very generic outputs. And this is because all of the beautiful variation in the data often gets lost when we try to build a model that finds patterns in that data. Spurious factors can influence the outcomes of these models. So this is a um, personality machine and some researchers showed that if you simply adjusted the, um, the contrast or the brightness or the saturation on the image, on the video as you were using this personality machine, it would conclude that you were more extroverted just because of a brighter saturation in your, in your, in your video. Not because your face is any different, but because of the image itself. So the, uh, one example from ChatGPT that, that's relevant to the kind of work that I do um, was I asked it to create a treatment plan for a patient in acute pulmonary edema. And it basically said, take them to the emergency department, run some tests and prescribe some medication. Thank you very much. I already know that my patient is here with me and I know what's wrong with them. So you can skip steps one and step two the presuppositions of the question are not captured effectively in the model and it's not understanding enough to produce a detailed and, and meaningful response for my query. Again, it's because it's aggregated. Yes, this is the template for treating people. <laughs> Bring them to medical care, run some tests and prescribe something. Yay, congratulations ChatGPT. Um, Data privacy and security are also issues here, and we heard a little bit about this um, from David earlier. We want to be able to work with highly sensitive data. We need to make sure that those, the marginalized and underrepresented groups are represented in our data, but we need to do that in a way that doesn't harm them. And I think Emily might say a little bit more about how we can think about that later. So we need to be, also alongside of all of this um, attempt to, to kind of have more diversity in our data, be thinking about methods that, that um, allow us to work with that data in ways that, that um, protect the, the rights and the characteristics of the individuals. Remember, who is your data? These are people in the data. We need to, to make sure that we're not inadvertently hurting them in some way. So can we use AI for good? Well, in fact, there, there are some activities, and I, I mentioned the hiring one using, using your facial cues, some problems for sure, but there may actually be ways to use AI. Sorry, I'm rattling a lot here. There may actually be ways to use AI um, to help us avoid some of this bias. So we can, we can anonymize job applications and perhaps remove some of the critical variables that are driving bias um, in the evaluation. AI can be used to monitor for bias and employee engagement and provide a tool, actually. 
All right, so why should you care about any of this, apart from the fact that you don't want to drive a self-driving car or sit in a self-driving car that was developed in the US and India? Actually, for companies, and it, we know that having a diverse group of people in the room, let alone represented in our data, actually drives innovation and creativity. And guess what? They make more money. So, you know, if, if, if sort of equity doesn't convince you, if fairness doesn't convince you, maybe the money will. Most of you are scientists, so you're probably not too, care, not too bothered by that. But, you know, it's, it, the, I think the point about diversity is much bigger than just it's the right thing to do. So what do we do? What can we do about this? And um, we heard Lisa saying, talking earlier about some things that she's been working on. Fantastic. There's lots of things that, that we can be doing. And Emily's going to going to expand on that. Try to hire for culture add rather than culture fit. Why? Because we know when we hire people that look like us, we get more of us. We need to prioritize data governance as well. And we need to approach AI with an ethical lens and ask these questions about how it works, how it was trained, what data it was trained on, how it might impact. We need to consider the context in which AI is going to be used and the potential for harm. It needs to be a key question we ask. We need to monitor every deployment of a tool for drift, for changes in the population, for errors that start to arise that we might not have anticipated. And we need to be able to react and respond to that. And I personally have a preference for human in the loop AI applications, and maybe that's because I trust people more than machines. And in fact, last year I published a paper where, the, it's a, a perspective paper, an opinion paper, where essentially we argue that, that humans have access to more context than models do, and we might want to consider building AI tests that support and augment human decision making by surfacing the relevant information they need and dealing with all the mass of, of information that's too hard for our little human brains to handle, but leave the really complex integration of that in information to the person. In the context of generative AI, I really think this is important. Otherwise, we're going to end up with this scenario in this comic, which is funny but literally came up in a conversation we had yesterday. So this, I think, is the future, where the AI is generating the email and the AI is responding to the email. What happened to the human? Is that what we want? Okay, so we want to be thinking about diversity and inclusion of the people involved in creating AI, the data itself, the users, and the target audience of the AI. And how, do we, how are we going to do this? Well, maybe we need some more transparency around how we build our models, how they work. We need some interpretability. We need a lot of education. And we need ethical frameworks. And for the rest, I'm going to hand over to Emily um, to take us to some of more of what we might need. Thank you. And we'll come back with questions later. Awesome. Um, so yeah, this talk might have a little bit of the dreaded audience participation in it. Uh, so sorry to pull that on you at the end of a long day, but uh, everyone look alive. Come on, we almost made it through. And hopefully if I can get my slides up soon, um, get started. Yay, awesome, awesome. So yeah, my name's Emily. I'm here to talk a little bit about more the policy side of equity and diversity, and how you can go about generating those kinds of diverse teams that Karen talked about and said were extremely useful. And thankfully, we've already had a little bit of information about this already. Lisa gave a fantastic addendum to her talk on hiring for these diverse teams in astrophysics. And that's great, because it actually saves me a lot that I have to talk about. I can just say, pay attention to what she said. But uh, an important thing I want to say uh, before I get started is that throughout all of this equity and diversity stuff, we can't forget that this is, the main reason we're doing this is because it's like the right thing to do. There are reasons why we might want to do this for like, uh, why we might want to do this for practical reasons. 
uh, there we go. We might want to do this for practical reasons, but um, my sort of hot take that I want to start with is that stereotyping and discrimination are bad, uh, and it sucks when they do them, and we should try to do less of them. Oh, that's not good. Come on, there we go, hooray. Um, and as someone who has been exposed to and been on the receiving end of a lot of this kind of negative stereotyping and discrimination, it's really unpleasant. And I've seen a lot of uh, mainly women, but also ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, be more or less pushed out of science despite being incredibly talented and incredibly successful as a result of these kinds of arbitrary factors. And that is a travesty that we should be trying to uh, get rid of. So. I want to talk a little bit about equity and diversity policies, right? Because individual action is important. We can all do our part. But there's sort of a coordination problem, right? And institutions can help us achieve things and set a unified direction that we wouldn't be able to do by ourselves. I've been working in this sort of space, working with equity and diversity initiatives and policies <coughs> since I was an undergraduate student. Some of them have been top-down sort of formal programs. Others have been very much more grassroots, independent, and informal programs. And so I thought I'd take the opportunity here to sort of uncork a few hot takes and talk about ways in which things can work and things can't work. And the real thing to keep in mind here is that like, what we're getting down to at the end of it is trying to live up to our principles as scientists, right? A lot of the stuff that we need to do um, to build these diverse teams, which are important to building sustainable teams, is really just trying to get back to the root of we're here to work together to try and solve these really hard problems. And we can't do that without diverse teams and without sustainable teams. And unfortunately, I have to say, high performance computing, there is still a problem with gender representation in HPC. Um, Computer science as a whole has quite low percentages of figures, as Karen said in her talk, and HPC is even lower still. And kind of uniquely among um, STEM fields, compared to say physics or chemistry or mathematics, um, the percentage of women in high performance computing and computer science has actually gotten worse since the 80s, uh, not better, which is the wrong direction that we want to be moving in. And really, the reason for this is not necessarily just about the money in the field, right? It's about feeling respected, feeling valued, uh, feeling like you're getting a fair go and that your contributions are really valued by the community. So let's talk about some of the ways that we should uh, go about that and some of the anti-patterns to avoid in these corporate diversity policies. So hopefully I can see a few smiles. Um, who's familiar with this particular image? Yeah, classic. Um, it's from a British sitcom from the 70s, I think called uh, Yes Minister, and it's satirizing uh, government bureaucracy and inefficiency within these sorts of large organizations. And if you work in a university, a lot of the same patterns will be familiar to you. And a trap that you can fall into when you're trying to do one of these equity and diversity policies is what they call the politician's logic, right? This idea that we have to do something about this because it's important. This policy is something, therefore we must do this thing. Um, and when you say it out loud like that, it's kind of silly, right? It's, it's obviously a bad logical reasoning, but it's quite an easy trap to fall into because you want to do something, right? You want to feel like you're achieving something. And this wouldn't be that much of a problem except for the fact that not every equity and diversity program is made equal, right? Some of them are more effective than others. And if you're not careful, you can end up with a dud or even worse, you can end up with a program that actually makes things worse than if you had done nothing at all. So mandatory equity and diversity trainings are a very, very common um, tool that people reach for as a first, oh, we must do something approach. You see it all the time in the news. Some large corporation has uh, leaks that indicate they have a problem with racism or sexism or ableism. And so they decide to set up some mandatory training for their employees. And yes, we're going to go at the problem. Unfortunately, if you do it badly, which it turns out a lot of trainings are quite bad, um, as we can see on this figure on the right here, whoops, wrong button, um, on this figure on the right here, um, if you do it badly, it can leave your organization with fewer women and people of color in management positions than if you had done nothing at all, which is really bad. That's the opposite of what we want if we're trying to do these sorts of programs. And this is a really, really strong finding across the field of social science, right? Across not just equity and diversity trainings, but even seemingly disparate things like anti-smoking campaigns. And the reason is this very common, um, very sort of intuitive model of how to get people to do things, that, uh, change their behavior, 
is this approach called the information deficit model of behavioral change, which sort of implicitly assumes people are doing the thing we don't want them to do because they just don't quite understand. And if we just give them the right information and we correct their misunderstanding, then they will do the right thing. And we like to believe that as scientists, right? Because what we try to do and what we try to live up to is to be evidence-based in our practices. If we're working in, say, chemistry, and someone publishes a paper with some data that suggests that the thing we are working on um, you know, might be incomplete or inaccurate, then we try and update our practice and update our beliefs in line with that new evidence. But that, unfortunately, doesn't really work when you try to scale it out to this kind of organizational-wide change. And the main point of contention really is like, why does this fail? And it turns out there's a couple of interrelated things that might happen. Um, and the big one is that if you frame it in terms of negative legalistic lights, saying these are all the bad things that can happen, and this particular minority group has a uh, number of you know, discriminatory stereotypes applied to them commonly, and you shouldn't do that because the law says you mustn't, then that can actually activate people's negative biases. It can make them feel like they're being attacked. It can make them feel like they're being a culprit. And no one wants to feel that, right? Like most people want to feel like they're part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And the other problem is that if you make it overly legalistic and frame it in terms of compliance, it gives the impression that these sorts of initiatives are a box checking program, right? That you're ticking it off to say, we've done the thing and that the organization doesn't really care about the results. And to an employee, if my organization doesn't care about this, then why should I? And the problem is with that yes minister type approach, if all you care about is being seen to do something for either compliance or PR reasons, then your corporate incentives will be misaligned, right? Your organizational incentives will be towards having a visible, out, uh, like, visible evidence of doing something rather than that something actually working. And that's the, not what we want to do. So anti-pattern number two, doomed committees, right? This is a very common thing that I've seen over the last decade of working in these spaces, serving on a few of these committees myself at various institutions here and there, um, which is that if you're creating an equity and diversity committee to try and centralize your policy goals for your organization, which is great, it's pretty clear that like, okay, it's a bad look if we have like only old dudes on the committee. So we should put some people from underrepresented minorities on there, which is great. You should talk to people from underrepresented minorities when making these sorts of policies. The problem is if you only have staff from those underrepresented groups who tend to have lower social capital and lower institutional capital, that's why we're doing this in the first place, um, and if the committee has no real ability to change things, right, it becomes an exercise in futility. And even worse still, if membership is not recognized come promotion time for these employees, then you can end up having them be worse off than if they hadn't taken part in the committee, right? And so this whole doomed cycle of committees is both really demoralizing and can actually materially harm the advancement of these kinds of uh, underrepresented employees. Now, there are ways to get around this. I'm not saying that all equity and diversity committees are bad. If done well, like has been the case at my current institution, if you, from the start, have buy-in from the top and signal, hey, we are going to take this seriously, then that can make some big changes. But you have to be very deliberate about this. Uh, and the third anti-pattern, Hopefully this figure is familiar to a lot of people here. It was drilled into my head in first year statistics. Uh, it's talking about survivorship bias. In World War II, a bunch of planes were getting shot down, as tends to happen in a war. And um, the Allied Air Command was essentially trying to armor planes up to make them more survivable. And initially they started, so the story goes, I don't know how true it is, that they were only armoring the bits with the red dots where it was shot and not the bits where it wasn't shot. It's kind of, eh, it's intuitive. But the problem is, right, problem is the planes that were making it back had obviously not had not been destroyed by these shots, whereas the ones we weren't seeing any planes that were shot in the white areas because they didn't make it back by definition, right? So it turns out armoring the, uh, the non-shot bits improved the uh, survivability of the planes. And the same thing is true here. If you are talking to people from underrepresented minorities, women, people of color, people with disabilities, etc and you only talk to people who are currently employed in your organization, especially at senior levels, you're going to be getting an under, a, a unrepresentative sample of people from that group. Because by definition, they have managed to survive the environment and make it this far. And that's fine to talk to people. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk to people. I'm here after all, and I've made it this far, hopefully. But really, if 
that's all you do, you're going to be missing out on a lot of really important information. And so I think a really underrate, underrated uh, way of improving equity and diversity policies and making sure they work is to actually seek out people who have left the field, either because they've been pushed out or because they just said, stuff this, I'm done, uh, and talk to them about why they leave and try to include that in your decision-making process. So just so I'm not all doom and gloom, I'm gonna talk about some good stuff, some positive stuff that you can do. Uh, and really the first thing you need to do is, as an organization, try and figure out, like, what are your values? And this is hard to do with something as big as a university because there's so many different schools and faculties, right? But just within your research group, you can try and think, what do we value? What are our principles? What do we want to do, right? And that will help you craft these kinds of equity and diversity policies such that they line up with those values. You should be really clear about what you want to achieve if you're going to do one of these and why you're doing it, and then set an idea of how you are going to determine success. Otherwise, you'll have no idea if you're actually getting results or if you're wasting your time. And this third point, which is really the main takeaway and what I wanted to say most of all in this talk, right? If you're in a decision-making position for this, try and spend some time kicking the tires on this stuff and figuring out, is this proposal that I want to do actually going to work? If you have a proposal for increasing the diversity of your hiring pipeline or for increasing retention across the career of your staff, try and engage with the large amount of social science literature out there and try and figure out, like, is this actually a promising result? And the thing is, I'm not asking you to become an expert in social science. There's a lot of it out there, and it's actually really hard. Like, social science is quite tricky to get right because humans are complicated. But someone in the decision chain somewhere should at least know enough about the state of the literature and the state of the research on what works and what doesn't to be able to guide this policy. You can, de you can delegate, that's fine. Consultants and uh, special teams have their place. But someone has to be able to, when presented with two competing proposals for what to do, be able to actually make a decision on the basis of whether something is likely to provide useful results. Um, it has to be supported top to bottom of your organization. Top down sort of uh, enforced directives rarely work very well. Uh, and similarly, bottom-up things. I'm a huge fan of grassroots uh, engagement, but they have sort of limited institutional power. So you have to have a little bit of both, right? And clearly, you need to have a positive messaging of your thing. As we saw in the, the research before, taking a framing that uh, sort of imply, implies that, say, to be blunt, white men are the problem is not really productive, right? Because we want to take this positive framing of here is what we want to achieve and here is how you can do it. We want to empower people to actually seek out opportunities to improve the diversity in their workplace, right? We want to empower employees and managers to make these sorts of changes. Positive exposure to minority groups in a peer context is actually really important. This is another very durable finding that if you just have people working with people from different backgrounds together on some non-equity and diversity related task like programming or running a committee or something like that, then that can really durably improve people's opinions of that. And lastly, a lot of this has been about stereotyping and um, sort of negative biases, and those are really important to deal with. But don't forget the material aspects as well. There's still huge gains to be made in things like recognizing uneven burdens of childcare across gender lines, or dealing with accessibility for disabled employees. And those can have really huge material gains to improving the equity and diversity of your workplace. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna leave up some useful starting points. Um, this is just a brief, brief sort of sampling of some interesting uh, like review papers and books that I have read in the process of gearing up for this talk. They're a great jumping off point to explore different parts of the literature. Um, I can particularly um, recommend Dobbin and Kalev, Getting to Diversity, What Works and What Doesn't. It's a very punchy book that just goes over all of the stuff that I've said in a lot more detail uh, with case studies and psychological studies to try and dedu deduce what can you do to make a difference. Uh, and then the rest of these are also great as well. So yeah, with that, um, I would like to open back up to questions for both Karen and myself and hope you are inspired to work together to make a change. Thank you.
Any questions? The speaker. I had one question. Is working. I had one question for Emily. The the um, the thing about mandatory training and the fact that it can trigger resistance in a sense. Yes. Um, do you think it works better potentially if you go the other way and you bring someone such as, for example, yourselves in to speak to? the group as opposed to telling people you go off and do this training yes i think so and i think making it opt-in and inviting people to come to you rather than forcing it on them yeah. seems to be less likely to induce backlash there's an interesting side of that though i ran a um a, a, a program last year that i informally refer to as the civility project and it was basically designed to, to make people more aware of respectful behaviors and how to manage respectful behaviors and have you know, productive, respectful relationships with their colleagues. And we did a survey beforehand and a survey afterwards. And we found that people were feeling less well-respected after the program. And I sat there going, oh, God, I failed. Like, why did I do this? I made things worse, right? And, and then it, like, I realized that what had happened was they were simply more aware of all of the disrespect that they had been encountering before and not really, you know, didn't have the, the framework and, the, and the, the tools for for recognizing, let alone dealing with it. And so I thought, okay, we've gone, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing, or maybe one step forward, two steps back, but we can move forward from here in a different way. And so, you know, starting from a different place, but. It, it's interesting how these, you know, knowing more about the problem um, can at first seem to bring you backwards a little bit. But I think it's, it, we have to start from there and acknowledging the problem in order to move forward. Thanks. So, um, uh, so I, I work at one of these HPC centers that, um, you know, historically have a pretty poor record um, in gender. Uh, recruitment. Are you aware of any facilities that, um, around the place that are exemplars um, for um, for this and actually are doing well? Not really in the HPC space. It's not the area that I'm most familiar with. Um, I actually do think my current employer, uh, and I'm not just saying that to sort of you know avoid you know. Uh, penalties for bad mouthing them. I think AIBN has done a really good job at improving this. Obviously, not perfect, but this kind of stuff that I've talked about of like having a uh, top down and bottom up commitment to improving diversity, making sure that during the hiring process, you know, they're really trying to avoid kicking people out based on sort of arbitrary factors. And if you look at the numbers at the senior level, it's still not so great, but there are, ha, has been a pretty big improvement in female group leaders uh, as a result of those um, processes. So I guess it's sort of science-y adjacent rather than HPC adjacent, but yeah. So, uh, thank, you, thank you for that. So, um, so this is a bit of a natural language thought experiment. I, I'm sure it must have been done, but I don't know much about na natural language processing, et cetera, so I'll pose it here. If we had an AI that we deliberately kept away from violent images, uh, you know, racist text, or you know, the internet. <laughs> uh, would it, would it be possible? Would would we still be able to guarantee that you know, like in that tweet that you showed that it went full Nazi in 24 hours or less than 24 hours? Would we be able to guarantee that that wouldn't happen just by curation alone? Ha. Guarantee is a very strong word. <laughs> um, I mean, they are statistical generation machines, right? So, so they're gonna they're gonna produce things that we can't control and can't guarantee. However, if the patterns are not in the training data, then it's it's very unlikely that they would, by chance, kind of kind of produce this sort of thing. Now, it depends on how dynamic they are. Um, you know, if they're if they're essentially integrating the inputs of, of the humans and parroting that back sort of in a very immediate way, then of course you can get it, you know, you can put it in a, put these models in a situation where they're gonna spit back exactly what, they've, what they're being, what they're 
hearing, right? Um, and so I don't think you can ever guarantee that, that you're not going to bring it down a rabbit hole where, where they're going to be producing you know, sexist, miso misogynistic, racist, whatever kind of language. So wh what is to be done then? What is to be done? Well, to lower the probability of producing that stuff um, is, one, is one thing. Um, and yeah, we need to, to, actually there's scientific questions around here. So what, what we're not doing with ChatGPT um, is, is really testing the limits and, and asking these questions in a scientific way. We're just sort of, you know, everybody, b millions of people on the planet are playing with it and we're, we have lots of anecdotes, but we don't have actually a scientific framework for answering the question you asked. Thanks. Hey, I have a question. Hi. Hey, um, thank you both for your talk. Um, uh, so I agree with what you've said about top-down, bottom-up approaches, right, for this whole, this whole subject matter. Um, and I think that we've, we or I, I can speak for myself, have been to a lot of conferences where we've done, done this, talked about it, talked about um, some cool books to read and, and things to do. Um, and then we go away and life happens and we want to be the advocates, but then, you know, we go back to work and you do your work. Um, I guess where I'm getting at is I think that in between the top down, bottom up, there's also a group of people who are influencers in an organization or people who would be in positions of leadership. It's not seniority. Leadership and seniority are very different things. Um, and in this space, it can be quite intimidating to speak up or to, to be a voice, even if you want to be on the inside. So do you, do you have anything tangible that we could all take away from today? Words that have helped you, um, actions that have helped you in the past or experiences that could help any of us at any level be advocates for, for this subject? I'm a storyteller. And I mean, I guess I'm at the top now, so I'm trying to influence things from the top down while encouraging the <laughs> bottom up. Um, but I didn't get here. I mean, I didn't like get a you know get my first job at a university, go straight into a dean role, right? I got here through that middle area, where along the way, basically, I would just call it out, <laughs> right? So. I, I felt safe enough in the environment that I was in to do that. But if I noticed things that, that were biased or that, you know, based on the experiences I've had, um, kind of were obvious to me that there was going to be some impact that nobody had really thought through, um, I would just say, hey, you know, have we th maybe thought about trying it a different way or have you considered the impact that this might have on, on this group of people? And just you know, not in a confrontational way, but just put the question out there. And then people go, oh, right, you know, I hadn't thought about that before. And just by asking the question, it puts it, puts it on the agenda and then it gets discussed. And, you know, the decision might not be to remove whatever the bias or the problem was, but I think just being aware of it, noticing things, and then not being afraid to just ask the question. <laughs> Um, I think can can then influence the decisions around. And I've always been big on changing people's minds because it's only sort of recently that I've had any degree of like institutional capital because you know I was a lowly PhD student for a long time. But I, I've been big on changing people's minds sort of before it gets to the point where you might need to call somebody out as well. You know, people are more receptive to a discussion from someone that they trust and who perhaps has maybe made it clear that like. I care about this sort of stuff. I care about women in science. I care about LGBT issues in science, but I'm not going to like do it to try to attack people. And if I can help people sort of feel safe with me, then when that time comes, you know, being able to speak up is a little bit easier if you've built that level of trust. And it's not really an easy takeaway because it involves like actually just talking to people over a long time to do this kind of work. But that's the only approach that I've found that has been really sort of sustainable long term. I don't know, does that answer your question, Aditi? It's, it's maybe not, not a, a one quick trick or something like that. But Yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know, you, you sort of have to pick your moments, sort of judge it based on 
how safe you think somebody is, but that's the only way to do it, is to just change people's minds. Why am I feeling uncomfortable? What, what's going on here? Um, and then it's usually what would happen is you know, this is fight or flight, right? But we would be like, sit down, be quiet. Now I'm trying to harness that, that feeling, trying to take on the different of that as the point where you stand up. It doesn't matter if you may be right or wrong in that situation, but you're being that voice for yourself. Yeah, lean into the discomfort. Yeah, it's not about being afraid. It's more about it's yeah, it's noticing how you're feeling, and and that's what I meant by storytelling. So often I I would, you know, find myself in a situation where I was feeling uncomfortable, and and then I would you know kind of think yeah, why am I uncomfortable? What's going on here? You know, what what does this moment mean for me? And then I would say something along the lines of. Hey, you know, um, look, in my experience, um, you know, he, in this situation, I would feel this way, or in the past, I felt this way, even if I was actually feeling in that minute, you know, I'd kind of talk about a, a story that happened in the past and how that impacted me and made me feel. And people are human, right? So then they go, oh, right, so you've experienced this before. Oh, well, let's try to avoid making you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and the other people, you know, who might be impacted. And so, yeah, I, I just, I, I, it's, sometimes I make stories up. Storytelling is, is also, you know, you're allowed to make stories up, but if it serves the purpose, right, and, and you know, it's usually an amalgamation, uh, sorry, to, to be like chat GPT, but, you know, it's usually an amalgamation of experiences that I've either observed or experienced myself, and, you know, you can tell those stories, and it's less confronting than just saying, what you're about to do is gonna hurt somebody. Um, so th thanks for the great talk. Um, so I, I just have a, a couple of comments and a, and a question. Um, so uh, I guess really starting off by, by stating something um, that I, I mean hopefully most people know is that I mean so th this is this is a really difficult um, thing to make progress in, and um, and a lot of it comes back to the concept of, of privilege and the fact that privilege is about what you didn't have to go through rather than what you did go through, right? And so so just I mean you can correct me if I'm connecting the dots between your two talks. Um, in, in uh, not how you intended, but um, you know, so the the thing with the AI and and the diversity and the training models is right is that um, you know that, that it's completely analogous to a lot of things that happen during the hiring process, and you know because you know you're hiring um, people and you need to provide a comparison and you need to define essentially a merit function um, in order to compare uh, those people and decide who you're going to hire, right? Um, uh, in a certain sense, and so. Um, and um, so one of the issues is that um, if you're from an underrepresented group, um, you know, it's typical that your career uh, trajectory does not look the same as somebody who comes from the majority. Um, and so I think really uh, a key example of this was recently there was, a, there was a talk given at the National Press Club by a, a person of colour from America who was, who was a, a, a very notable biologist. Um, and, you know, he said, my path to tenure was not the same as other people's path to tenure. Right, and so, um, and so this also links back to this concept of there being a, a critical point in that, uh, which if, if you know, um, uh, a group achieves a certain percentage of representation, then, you know, there's probably enough uh, recognition of, of how those trajectories look like that, you know, you can start, you know, achieving the sorts of, of levels of representation that are appropriate for that. Um, but, I mean, so just use HPC as an example where, you know, um, there's just, you're starting from a really low percentage, for example, of, of uh, people who identify as women. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's just trying to increase those numbers to the point that you start getting close to that uh, critical point 
seems like a real challenge. And so with the, this, I, I guess, AI proposal that you, you're talking about in terms of maybe using artificial intelligence to try to maybe reduce or eliminate some of the bias that goes into those processes, um, you know, I, I guess, is it, is it sort of realistic to expect that, you know, that's something that, that can be done in terms of these models or is the fact that, you know, um, we're just going to end up back with the average um, effect, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, because of the disparity in the sample sizes? That's a tricky one. I don't have an answer other than to say that, you know, the models will optimize for whatever we tell them to optimize for. So, you know, we, maybe that's also a little bit in the, in the learning function, right? So what's the, what's the, what's the objective function of the, of the model that's used to drive the training? Um, if we're always saying, you know, if there's a singular, it usually is one function, right? And we sort of say, yeah, what we want is success, define success. There's many different ways of defining that. Um, and, and so we have to be careful that what we're measuring, both on the input side and to drive the performance of the, of the model, the learning function, um, doesn't reinforce the bias that we're trying to, to avoid. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. You just got to be careful, I guess, and, and think through um, things. You know, it's also like in hiring, it's about what questions you ask, right? Um, you know, in academia, we, we, have, we have very, we have H indexes and we have, um, you know, all sorts of things that, that can be abused for, for evaluating people. You know, the ARC has decided, okay, we're going to have relative to opportunity assessment. We're going to give people the chance to explain career breaks or nonlinear trajectories in their, in their progression and um, these sorts of things that every, all of these little changes will help, right? Um, people have said to me, why don't we have completely anonymous applications? Well, if you're anonymous, then you can't explain the context of your career. And, and then actually that introduces a different kind of bias because there isn't the opportunity to, to give that context. We're more than our CVs, aren't we? So I think you know, that, that is, we have to change the metrics if we're gonna, if we're gonna change the outcome. Thanks, Alex. We're very interested to hear your opinions on um, workload versus representation in uh, committees, you know, giving recruitment as, as, as an example. Um, for an average uh, Australian faculty of engineering, you will be around low 20% uh, female academics. Uh, in this morning's talk, we heard about the, the impact of having 50% representation on recruitment committees. And that then the, the concern that I have, uh, you know, voice voiced to me by female colleagues is they are on, you know, roughly three times the recruitment committees that the, the their male colleagues are, and so how do we get this? How do we get this 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 this, this right? Do we do we do we aim to stay 10% ahead of the current uh, situation so that it's it's a moderate overloading or somehow correct in some other in some other way? But with with every committee having the same target, it's 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 very very yep. That's difficult to achieve this, without. We call this the female tax, um, and absolutely 100. percent if, if we're in the minority and we want all of those recruitment panels to be 50 50, um, at least that means that the women have to they're going to be doing more of those panels because that that's that's what happens. So we have to find ways to. Yeah, make room for that and make that part of the contribution to you know, the metrics that we're, we're evaluating. And so we have to value that, right? It can't, as Emily said, just be a tick box, right? It can't be just something we do to say we've done it. We have to then follow through on that and realize that, yeah, okay, if the women are in three times as many committees as the men, and the men are just off you know, writing papers and, and driving their, their, their H index up, um, that we shouldn't be comparing the H indexes without understanding that there's other contributions that are also valuable. And I think, you know, most, most institutions are maturing on this, right? If you look at promotion criteria in, in most Australian universities, 
over time, it's evolving and, and we're adding in different dimensions. And certainly at RMIT, um, internal engagement in the life and the service of the, of, the, of the school, the college, the university is valued in a very explicit way. And you can't actually even get promoted anymore unless you're engaging with these cultural issues within the university. And I guess also just, oh, sorry, just to quickly add to that and sort of ties into Asim's thing about like, what are we optimizing for in the hiring process? The two things I wanted to add are like, the, idea, the ideal that I think we should be aiming for is trying to recruit people based on their ability to do the job and uh, excel at it and not based on arbitrary factors like race or gender or dare I say H-index, which is a proxy and not the actual thing that we're trying to measure, right? And this idea of how do you measure productivity in academia or even in software engineering where it's actually a lot easier but still really hard is probably understudied. And an underrated way I think of doing this is to step back and think, what are we trying to achieve by this? We wanna have lots of women on hiring committees so that the committee is more representative and it might make more representative decisions. But like, are there other ways that we could achieve that goal without putting excess burden on women? And you know, that is something that I think is worth engaging with at an institutional level, just taking a step back a little bit on that front. Yeah, and Lisa mentioned a few things too, like, like you know, does your job ad um, have a very kind of, does it set expectations and have language in there that, that um, reads very masculine? And it comes back to this sort of, who are you even inviting? So like your panel can be diverse, but if the applicant pool is not diverse, then in the first place, then, then no matter what you do, you, you're not gonna have success in, in, in moving the dial. So yeah, I agree. Like there's different ways of engaging people and you know what, guess what? We can, we can bring some men along for the journey and you know, also help them to understand uh, you know, the value of the diversity like we're doing today and, and hopefully you can become you know, part of the solution rather than in reinforcing the problems. No. Yeah, so then I come back to the AI harm, right? So thinking through um, what the perhaps unintended um, consequences are of that. So, I mean, you know, if, if Facebook is using a model of me that's biased, which results in them showing me, I don't know, more lingerie or something than, than um, my partner, well, okay, you know, I can choose to buy the lingerie or not. Um, they're obviously biased because they think, you know, a woman of my age, she must need some excitement in her life, whatever. Um, buy the lingerie. Like, is, is it hurting me? It's annoying me. It's not really hurting me. So, but, you know, but that's not a hiring decision. That's not a, a promotion decision. That's not something that has a material impact on my daily life. So I think it depends on the application context, right? Depends on what problem. But you know, if I'm in a healthcare setting, I yes, you need to know that I'm a woman because that impacts, you know, the the my biology in pretty obvious ways. Um, but it also impacts the, the 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 model. I don't want a model that's been developed only on men, <laughs> um, right? Because I don't know how it'll apply. And in genomics, we didn't we didn't I have lots of data about this, but but um, in genomics. If you look at like the Human Genome Project, which, which we heard all about earlier today, um, something like 80% of the genomes that we have in our reference libraries are from Caucasian men. 
And um, if we look at clinical trials, women are way underrepresented in clinical trials because of exclusion factors. Guess what? You get excluded if you're pregnant most of the time. You get excluded, well, you know, women can be pregnant more often than men. Um, so, you know, they're going to be more often excluded. You get excluded if you're above a certain age. Women live longer. So, you know, the, in terms of population distribution, again, we're not represented um, as much as we should. And, you know, there's like a million examples like this where because, you know, maybe women are less available to, to even show up for the clinical trial because they're, they're caregivers and they can't afford, you know, to, to be there at 7 p.m. for the blood draw or whatever it is, right? So there's lots of, of both explicit criteria and, and soft criteria that impact our representation. All of those things mean that, that the scientific conclusions we're drawing on a supposedly you know, representative sample of the population are in fact not completely valid. Hi. Um, uh, this is a slightly more pragmatic question, or uh, in fact, it's probably taking liberties with your time for some free consulting. But um, uh, I'm, a, I'm in the process of building out a team, working in the HPC space. It's the sort of um, care and feeding end of the business rather than the software engineering stuff. And um, I am unable to uh, attract talent to apply for the positions, I, unless they, they fit a particular model. Uh, the extent of our diversity is um, some of our applicants are from Eastern European descent and some are from Western European descent. And uh, there's, there's a bit of diversity, uh, but no gender diversity at all. And I don't know what I'm not doing um, with respect to trying to attract that talent in to at least apply for the role. And then I have the secondary problem that were I successful, they would be an island in a team of people who are essentially middle-aged white men. Um, and how do I then reinforce and bolster and grow a team that is um, of a younger generation because we're teams aging out, but also much more representative of a diverse community? Look, I think just asking the question is the first step. So, you know, the fact that you're asking these questions and you care about this means I think you'll find a way to, 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 to address it. Um, more pragmatically, um, you know, women find each other, especially when they're in the minority. So, you know, I personally am involved in all sorts of women in systems engineering, women in computer science, women in technology kinds of groups. And, you know, if you know a few women who are, you know, the right, sort of, you know, and I have the right sets of skills and experiences, tap into them and say, do you know anybody in your network um, who, who might be interested? Because often these women, you know, they might not actively be looking for a job, um, but they're out there. You just need to find, you know, creative ways of, of getting them to apply in the first place. And then even if you have only a few applicants, I think Lisa alluded to this earlier, you know, make sure you set up the process of, of assessing them in such a way that it doesn't mean that, you know, you, 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 ex, you exclude, exclude them right from the beginning. Um, so what we've been doing in our recruitment is I shortlist men and women in completely separate pools. If you're not getting any, this is going to be harder, but I mean, our pools are very imbalanced, you know, we, we get about, well, it re reflects the broader population, but we get about 15% of our applicant pool for level B, and it's worse when you go up. Um, but at level B, we're, we're getting about 15% women in the pool. But my short list is 50-50. Why? Because I looked at the women, and I looked at the men, and I gave my panel marching orders. I said, you will short list um, a roughly even amount of, of, of women and men. And guess what they did? And these women are amazing. So, you know, we, I don't know how, who we're gonna hire at the end. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say you must recruit a woman, a woman, but it's also about the process to get there. So are there any things like obvious keywords that are detrimental or, or, or positively asserting that we could be putting into our job descriptions? What yes. Are the, There's, what are the things that the, we should be at RMIT, we have a tool. It's available. It's called Text.io. Text.io. I, I think something like that. 
where they will tell you if this reads, if this tends feminine or this tends masculine. Um, you obviously need to write it in such a way that you can have it assessed by this tool. But um, my stuff tends feminine, strangely. I don't know why. Um, but whatever, whatever I write in a job ad um, passes the, the femininity marker. Um, maybe, you know, that's why we're getting more. I don't know. But yeah, you'd be surprised how sometimes if you look at the key selection criteria, again, it comes back to the metrics. So like what kind of person are you looking for? And if you put things in your job ad that say, you know, that, well, like, okay, we, did we talk about this yesterday? Andrew Ng put, who's the, you know, machine learning guy who has all, he's famous, right? Um, from, from ex-Stanford. Um, he publicly states that he only wants people who are willing to work 70 hours a week. That this is the kind of team he wants to build because those are the committed people. Well, I can pretty much guarantee you, you put that in a job ad, you know, we expect you to work really long hours and don't see your family. Um, you will exclude a bunch of men as well, but you will disproportionately exclude women. So if you have anything in there that basically channels all we care about is your research productivity, how hard you work, and you're willing to sacrifice your personal life, you will lose women. 